and and so we'll go ahead and get started. Today's presentation is being brought to you by SAA's Technical Subcommittee on Encoded Archival Standards, or TSEAS. My name is Corey Neimer, um, and we have a few members of the TSEAS group um, working as facilitators and co-hosts, uh, including Karen Bredenberg, Kristen Arnold, uh, Mary Samuelian, Laurie Lindbergh, Alex Dure, Anna McCormick, and again, myself. Um, for this first part of the session, we'll be focusing on the major revision of EAD, or Encoded Archival Description. Um, and again, our presenters for this section are Karen Bredenberg, uh, co-chair of TSEAS, who will give a brief introduction to the subcommittee's work in general. I will also hear from Kirsten Arnold, EAD team lead of TSEAS. Uh, who will then introduce a major the major revision of EAD with an overview of the expected timeline and some general aspects that this revision intends to address and cover. And then after the presentation, again, we'll move into breakout groups, and we'll be asking each of you to join one of these three groups where we'd love to hear from you. Um, and those groups will be led by Mary, Laurie, and Kirsten. So at this point, I'll hand this over to our presenters. Thank you, Corey, and welcome, everybody. I'm actually going to say it's in the middle of the night over here where Kirsten and I am, and we know it's a bit earlier for you, for you. so we are happy to see you here. And I'm just going, as Corey said, do a brief introduction to TSEIS. So you already heard we are the technical subcommittee on, on encoded archival standards and at the Society of American Archivists. We have a longer presentation regarding the background and the work we do, uh, which you can find on YouTube. But in short, we take care of the formats that you use to manage and share archival information. And we need your comments, suggestions, and bug reports. And today is going to be a huge input from you to us in the revision work that have started for EID. So, you can find more about us on our microsite at SAA. Uh, we have to do the most of the work on GitHub. So there you have all the uh, schemas, you have the sub team notes and everything and the wiki. Uh, EID is publicated at the Library of Congress and EIC at the Staatsbibliothek in Berlin. You can contact us in many ways. I have not put webinars as this one on the list, but we have the EID mailing list, which covers all the EIS standards. We have an email address, which you can send an email and it get, will be handed over to the correct person in TCIS. And you can write in your own language. language. If you're not comfort, comfortable with English, we can cover uh, huge amount of languages nowadays. You can report an issue through GitHub. Uh, I think Kirsten has already had you do that in the, the revision process. And we also have a form on the microsite where you can actually report an issue that we will then take care of and put into GitHub for you. So we are a team of about 25 members. We are splitted, so we are 50-50 SAA members, and the rest is international. And international, you look at me and Kirsten coming from Europe, but we also cover South America, Africa, Asia, and Oceania. And we have splitted the work into teams because we do have the responsibility for a number of standards. So we have a team for EAD, as is, which is the team you are helping today. We have one for EACCPF and we have one for functions. Uh, aiding these three teams, we have a schema team who are responsible for working with the schemas and the technical part of the tag libraries. And then we have the big contributor today, the outreach team who helps us with setting up and communicating with all of you. We have a 
two different kinds of revisions. We have minor revisions, the one we do on a rolling basis. You can read more about that, that on in the wiki, but that's fixing spelling errors and those kind of things. And then we have the focus for today, a major revision. And that is something that are to occur every fifth year following the regulations by the standards committee. So we have started this process up and in, in that we need to just not only need, we want to have your input so we can make it the best new version ever. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Kirsten and let you talk about the revision itself. Thank you very much, Karin, for the introduction. Um, can directly go to the next slide. Um, first thing that I wanted to present to you is the timeline, the expected timeline that we currently have for the revision of EAD. Um, so this all started end of 2020 when we submitted EAD to SAA to start the revision process. Uh, so that is picking up on the guidelines and regulations that Karen just mentioned with regard to major revisions of the SAA maintained standards. Um, throughout last year, we had uh, various pieces of activities to understand the status quo. So we had a survey where we asked uh, colleagues to give us in some information about the, the version of EAD that they are using and how they are using it. Um, and we also had an EAD3 implementation webinar where colleagues from all around the world um, told us a little bit about their journeys in terms of EAD. Um, and we are currently in the phase where we have a general call for comments open. Um, we published that end of last year and it's still open until the end of this month. Um, so hopefully the meeting today will also give um, all of you some ideas with regard to what you would want to see in a new version of EAD. And this will also kickstart the actual revision process. So based on the feedback that we are receiving, but also based on some general themes that I will come to in a few minutes, we are going to look at ED, how it currently stands, and look at the requirements in terms of archival description in the current context, um, and hope to then provide a first draft of a new ED, which will be ED 4.0. Um, towards the end of 2023, so the end of next year. Then you will again have a possibility to provide feedback on this draft, which we will take up and um, provide a finalized version of AD 4.0 then the year after, so uh, towards the end of 2024, early 2025. Next slide, please. And if everything goes well, uh, we will submit EAD 4.0 to SAA for approval in early 2025, aiming at a publication of it um, in the second or third quarter of that year. Throughout the whole process, the EAD team will have monthly meetings. Um, as we are an international team, as Karen just mentioned, um, these happen uh, virtually. But we are also looking into possibilities to have one or maybe two multi-day meetings um, of the team where we all come together. Um, some of you might know uh, TSES has just gone through a revision of ECCPF, the related uh, encoded archival standard. Um, and there we found it really helpful to come together personally um, back then we still could uh, and um, discuss the various aspects uh, of the revision process. Next slide, please. Two things that we want to highlight in this uh, revision process is that we are looking into new ways to engage with the community throughout the whole process. And today's webinar is just kind of a starting point for this. Um, and we really want to give the community the possibility to engage with TSES throughout this process, not only via giving feedback uh, on GitHub or via the web form that Karen mentioned, but also in the context of these interactive webinars. 
Um, that could be general webinars like today, uh, but we are also imagining uh, potentially targeted webinars on specific parts of the description uh, that we want to review. Next slide, please. So what is the status quo of EAD at the moment? And I think one of the biggest challenges that we are faced with in the context of this revision is the fact that EAD is currently used in two versions in parallel. So while there is the version EAD3, uh, the latest version, which was published in 2015, uh, we know that there's still a lot of use of EAD 2002 around, and um, we do not want to kind of just go over that fact, but address that fact in the context of the revision, ideally coming up with a new version that shows benefits for both EAD 2002 and EAD 3 users alike. Next slide, please. The other point is that EAD is becoming more and more of an exchange format. So while there still is lots of hands-on work ongoing with the XML documents themselves. We also know that a lot of you are using ED mainly as an export format. So this is something that is coming out of your archival management systems um, and you might not necessarily actively engage with the ED XML directly. So that is why we are also looking into feedback from people who are more thinking along the general archival description lines and are not necessarily thinking about how this is encoded um, in XML. So a new version also needs to kind of look at that. So the, the question of what do archivists need to describe and what do users want to know or search for. Um, and then it is on us as the technical subcommittee to think about how can we translate that into something that machines can process. Next slide, please. In terms of the main aspects that we have identified so far from the work that we've been doing throughout the last year, but also generally in TSEES, um, there are, there's one big theme um, which is alignment with ECCPF 2.0. Um, so that's the new version which is currently being submitted to SAA for approval. Um, and in the process of revising ESCCPF, we already have talked a lot about how to make both standards fit better together, so to say. Um, so this is also following a shared schema approach to enable more interoperability. And to just mention a few aspects that this will include with regard to changes in EAD. Uh, we have decided that we will go for camel case spelling with regard to the element names and the attribute names. There will be an enhanced approach to how dates and places are encoded, uh, which will be the same approach over both uh, encoded archival standards. Um, and there will be more possibilities for document internal and document external referencing. And the latter um, is specifically looking at integration of linked open data vocabularies as one example. Next slide, please. The other topic is EAD's relation to other standards. And on the top of that list is records and context. Uh, so the um, new overall archival description standard that the colleagues at the expert group for archival description for the ICA have been developing throughout the last few years. Um, but we are also looking at other related standards like premise and preservation metadata in general, uh, bibframe, schema.org archetypes and how that can be supported. Um, and we are also looking into potential different formats to provide the schema deliverables that we will also be working on in terms of JSON or JSON-LD. Next slide, please. Then there are a few more general aspects that kind of relate to the archival descriptions themselves and what they include. And one thing um, that we want to look at specifically is digital objects and how information to digital objects can be encoded, um, and that is digitized material, but of course also born digital material. Um, we are looking again into the question of supporting multilinguality. 
um, mapping to and integration of linked data vocabularies. So, so that is something where we will pick up on what ECCPF will be introducing. And we will review the question of granularity of encoding, specifically with regard to all the options of formatting and mixed content that EAD currently holds and the question of how is that used um, and how should it be used. Um, and in this context, we are also considering the option to maybe have a simple and an extended version of the schema. Um, so a simple version, which is kind of free of all of that um, and is more easily uh, processable by machines while the extended version might still be able to support also formatting and similar aspects. Next slide, please. Next to the content related aspects of, of EAD and its revision, we've also been talking about some contextual aspects. Um, and one big topic in this part is the question of how can we make it easier to upgrade to a new version? Um, so looking into the point that we want to make the incentives, the benefits clearer when it comes to upgrading from either EAD 2002 or EAD 3 to the new version. Um, and that uh, is supported by, for example, official transformations that uh, the schema team of TSES will be working on. But we are also looking into the question of um, could we maybe provide templates uh, for the new version in different formats that people can then use and more easily kind of integrate into their into their processes to update to a new version. Next slide, please. Along with that, we are also looking into extending the supporting resources. So you probably all are familiar with the tech library that uh, EAD and ECCPF offer. Um, ECCPF has started working on a best practice guide, which is essentially extending on what there is in the tech library and kind of looking at groups of elements um, that are used for specific parts of the description rather at looking at it element by element. So we hope that this will also help people to, to get an understanding of what might make sense for them to use in their different contexts. Um, we will continue providing mappings and crosswalks with related standards um, that would be specifically looking at records and contexts, but potentially also others. Um, and then we would want to support all of that with example files and use cases, which would again be one of the points where the community comes in, so where you come in, um, because while we ourselves are representing different institutions that use EAD, uh, we might not cover all kind of use cases that there are and all contexts that there are. Um, so we're always looking into example files from the real life to support the use cases that we want to present. Next slide, please. One last thing is that we are also looking into supporting the revision with tools and techniques. So we are considering uh, whether we should um, cooperate more actively with, for example, companies like Synchrosoft. So the um, company behind Oxygen as one of the bigger XML editors when it comes to commercials. Um, or looking into the question of, can we create something like that would be functioning like a plug-in for solution providers to use. And we also want to tap into the education around the encoded archival standards um, to see how we can support making that education more adaptable to different contexts. And that also means in our context, making it more adap adaptable for international use. Next slide, please. And this is the point where we would start putting all of you into breakout rooms. Um, so uh, we have prepared a few questions for each of the breakout rooms, which you will be asked by the facilitators. Um, as Corey mentioned at the beginning, in the breakout rooms, you will um, all be able to unmute yourselves um, to put on your cameras if you want. The breakout rooms will not be recorded. Um, and I hope we will have a fruitful discussion. 
we'll come back to this main room all together in about uh, 40 minutes. So there should be enough room, hopefully, for everyone to uh, be able to provide their views and their opinions. So looking forward to seeing some of you in one of the breakout rooms. And we'll be back all together in about 40 minutes. Okay. I hope everyone has found their way back into the main room. Um, I'd like to ask the, the facilitators, so Laurie and Mary, um, to maybe just give a, a brief in, um, summary of, of the discussion in your groups, anything that, that stood out for you, um, anything you want to highlight. Mary, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Kirsten. Um, I, I think um, what really, there were a few things. First of all, the time went way too fast. I didn't get through all the questions, um, which is great. Um, <laughs> but I think there, there are a few things that kind of struck um, me is that um, a, a lot, quite a few of the participants, they actually didn't learn much about EAD um, in school. Um, and when it was offered through um, their institution, it was usually as a, an elective and not a course that was required. So that I thought was kind of interesting. Um, with that said, I think a lot of people are learning it on the job. Um, but the flip side of that is what they did learn in school with the hand coding has actually helped them in their job professionally. So that that's kind of an interesting twist to it. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting is um, several of the participants in the class or in the breakout session, they've not necessarily have created um, crosswalks, but they've created a mapping from like the EAD element to DAC so that there's a clear understanding of kind of how they are related to one another. Um, and um, we also talked a little bit about um, how um, individuals continue learning about EAD and there was a variety of, of ways, but primarily through webinars like this, through journal articles, um, there are some online forums, um, and some people also, when they use archive space, they just kind of learn about it as a new version of archive space um, <clears throat> comes up. The last thing that I'd like to mention, I thought there were um, a lot of interesting ideas of potentially how to, um, you know, get uh, students and young professionals more engaged with um, EAD in one way was to have maybe lunch and learns or sessions where you can, you know, learn one element um, or maybe have a YouTube video where you teach them how to use EAD. So um, it was a really interesting, um, a lot of insight into how young professionals and students kind of learn EAD. Thanks very much, Mary. Lori, how, how was your group? They were great. We talked so much. I mean, I couldn't believe how, I agree, Mary, the time went so fast. I was blown away. I was like, oh my God, we only have five minutes left. <laughs> so um, we, we learned, if I could summarize everything, not everybody uses archive space. And uh, they, a lot of repositories have their own custom things that they have to, to, to work within that um, they then have various steps that they have to go through. And so for a lot of, a lot of places, um, they, they have their own uh, developers who develop the tools that they need. And then sometimes there are challenges with trying to really adapt um, the code to the technology and having to, to do some tweaking and things like that to, to really make it work based on the total solution package that they have you know, and the architecture. So that's, uh, that's a challenge. One of the things we talked about uh, as far as the students who are taking it that, um, um, and for 
uh, everybody who utilizes it, that it would be a great way to, to, we should develop some place where people can share their experiences and we can learn from each other or they can learn from each other, you know, to, you know, how do you do it? And what are some of the tips and tricks that you do? So we, we need a little bit more of an interactive uh, opportunity for people who are EAD implementers um, that they can share some of their best uh, best tips and tricks and some of their architectures so that um, that will you know benefit everybody I think we talked a little bit about utilization of oxygen and um, and so there are a few few people out there who are using it and so we should continue I think just in in this webinar so we know that there's lots of people out there who are utilizing it so we should continue to work with them um, and I think we should investigate looking at um, some of these other uh, popular technologies that we're finding other people uh, using and trying to share their experiences how that, those can um, those can influence others and affect and help, they can help each other. That was really it. It was a lot. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think that that last point is probably one point that I, I would kind of want to, to um, support also from the conversation that we had, had in our group, uh, specifically uh, when it comes to, um, for example, being the only person in, in your organization or generally the only person um, having to do all of this, um, kind of having having places where you can um, find examples from, from others, um, see how they relate to your work um, is useful, um, having a possibility to exchange with, with colleagues if, if you are the only one kind of doing this work um, was also mentioned as, as something that, that people found helpful. Um, I think also for educators too, it would be helpful to uh, try to see if we have any interest with educators because one one of our educators did mention that they thought it would be really good for us to be able to do the same thing, share how we're teaching. Um, if you have a whole semester, what do you do? If you don't have a whole semester, what do you do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I think otherwise, uh, so in our group, we had kind of the, the spread from uh, people working in oxygen, doing the, the XML work uh, to people um, mainly kind of using EAD as an exchange format or as something that, that is in the, the back end, so to say, of, of um, systems like archive space, um, or only also kind of just starting out on, on their journey in, in EAD and kind of looking at it. Um, from perspectives of, of specific types of material. So that was also one thing that we, we talked about in terms of um, how, 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 how good a fit is EAD um, for certain types of materials, specifically in terms of kind of audiovisual um, and um, documents and, and things like this. Um, and- um, Yeah, that also came up in our group too. <laughs> yeah. So that might also be something to, to look at in terms of the revision, so another kind of piece of, of description um, to, to see how we can integrate that. Okay, thank you very much, both of you. Um, and of course, to everyone in the groups for their input. We've got about 10 minutes left. So I would just want to um, give the opportunity for any last comments, any questions, maybe also to the to the presentation that we had before the breakout groups, we didn't really have a chance to uh, do that. Um, I see Kate has raised her hand. Um, I'm just going to try to see if you can unmute yourself. It might. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Oh, Questions about um, some things I've been wondering about changes to EAD. Um, the first one is a technology related problem, which is that when we present EAD to other people outside of our um, profession and allied professions, they don't understand why there's no explicit ordering of data in the records in that you sort of, they look at an EAD and they go like, oh, it's just, you take it as it is. And, but sometimes they get very confused by that. 
So I don't know if it's it's a thing that you've even been discussing of potentially adding information about explicit ordering of data elements or explicit ordering of components. Um, but that's something that we've been countered when we've talked to outside consultants about data. Um, and the other thing is um, in line with something, a conversation happening in archive space, which is, um, so EAD, again, it's this implied that if you have one originator who's more important than another one, you'll put them first. Um, that is to say, you know, a, a personal name or a corporate name that's important, you'll put it at the top. Um, and again, that's an implicit order thing um, that I'm wondering if there's any conversation that's happening in the group about making some of these implied things explicit so that we could designate like a main entry kind of concept, like the Mark 1XX equivalent kind of data. Um, so I don't know if you've had conversation around that, but I'd be interested. I, I think there might be some conversation starting that way um, with archive space a little bit, at least around the, the idea of designating um, a primary creator name. Okay. Um, so I, I have to know, we, we haven't gotten into into these details yet, but it's it's certainly a good point, um, specifically the, the relation to, to archive space that you mentioned in terms of the records creators. Um, in terms of the first point, would you have any examples for that? So any specific elements that people kind of expect to be in, in a certain order? Um, Hi, <laughs> sorry. Um, again, it's it's mostly things that are, there are a lot of them, things like components or, or the children, like child components, it's, it's obvious that there's, that comes after because it's nested, but how do you order the, the data inside of a component, for example? Um, it's easy when it is a different element. So, oh, you want, you want origination to come first and then you want title or vice versa. Those are things that's easy to set, tell a technologist uh, to do. But when they look at a bunch of components um, and you say, take them in the existing order, they get very, and I'm not sure why, but they would like an explicit order, say, of every element within, um, of, say, every subordinate component within a set of, within a component or every, let's, I'm going to just say series, like, so you have a list of series, which one of those comes first? They want to know that because to them, the encoding looks identical. It's just the occurrence in the file for them seems a very gelatinous way of indicating um, order because it's implied rather than explicit. Yep. Okay, thank you. We can ID them. <laughs> that's always the, I mean, that's the most obvious way I would do it. Uh, it's, um, depends because um, IDs generated automatically by a system, the, yeah. and the ID will change. They will not be, the latest added will get the highest ID number and it won't necessarily be in the order in which you want it to be. <laughs> Thanks very much, Kate. Um, anyone else having any, any questions or any comments? Any thoughts? You, you can put that in the chat or you can do as, as Kate and raise your hand and we can help you unmute. I don't know if XSLT, I mean, XSLT would do that, Hugh, but I just don't know if, um... That's what they're talking about in Kate's uh, respect. I think I'm not. I'm not certain. Okay, I think you might want to follow up. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, the uh, my thought is just from the technologist's point of view is that you, if you're just looking through a document, that just makes a lot of sense just to get the first one of your hit that counts. So, like, I'm just thinking that it makes their confusion makes a lot of sense to me having worked a little bit with uh, XSLT and transforms and such. So, um, no explicit order, and you're kind of thinking, why not? Why does it matter? But my understanding from EAD uh, is that it has a little bit like Ferber. Like it's got like you got higher levels of description than of everything, and then you have more explicit as you get into lo lower levels. Um, so anyway, that's my thought. I only deal with it going back and forth to Dublin Core. So. Yeah, thank you. I, th I think uh, specifically uh, kind of uh, the relation between EAD and a um, more straightforward standard like like Dublin Core, where you also kind of have just a, a fixed set of, of elements and, and are kind of just looking at it item by item um, is, is a tricky one, specifically if you want to kind of recreate the hierarchy that EAD has from, from Dublin Core. Um, Okay, so we are nearly out of time. One minute left. Uh, last chance for anyone. I'm just going to put up the last two slides then. Yep. <laughs> So yes, yeah, so this is just kind of um, combined with a thank you for your participation today and for your comments, uh, a reminder that you can still um, report an issue or provide us with feedback um, on, on anything EAD related. Um, I'm also gonna post both of these links in the chat then it's easier to grab them. Um, and uh, if you want to kind of continue having this conversation with us and, and help us through the revision. Uh, we also will be sharing um, a link to uh, a feedback form, so to say. Uh, so that is the second one. Um, there are just kind of a few questions um, and we would very much appreciate your input um, for today. Thanks very much again. Uh, I wish everyone uh, a nice rest of your days, evenings, nights, depending on where you are. Um, and uh, hope to see you soon in a similar context like today. Thank you very much. <laughs>